Hello, and welcome to A Sound Constitution here on CHLY 101.7 FM, a show where we focus on health topics important to our community. This year's team is made up of eight third-year VIU nursing students. Our goal is to demystify health issues and address common misconceptions by sharing evidence-informed information from a variety of reliable resources. All information provided on our show will be available in our show notes on our Facebook and Instagram pages. We want to remind our listeners that the information presented in the show is for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice of your primary health care professionals. If you have any questions or concerns about what's being discussed, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook at A Sound Constitution, Instagram at CHLY A Sound Constitution, Twitter at ASC underscore VIU, or email us at a soundconstitution at gmail.com. We would like to start off our episode by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Sinemo people, the broadcasting range that overlaps the Quatsin and Slyamin territories. This acknowledgement is done with gratitude to the Sinemo people and with the intention to increase awareness about truth and reconciliation processes and efforts on Vancouver Island. Additional information and resources surrounding Sinemo history, reconciliation, protocol, and land acknowledgement can be found on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages. Hi, I'm Cassidy, your host for this week's episode, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Ashley, Tyler, and Ashley. This week's episode takes a look at blood, organ, and tissue donation in BC, and will feature interviews with special guests Kate Chong from the Kidney Foundation, Elaine Young from BC Transplant, and Patricia Wilms from Canadian Blood Services. Joining us now, we have Elaine Young, the Manager of Communications and Community Relations for BC Transplant, and Kate Chong, the Director of Programs and Services for the Kidney Foundation of Canada, BC, and Yukon Branch. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Could you tell us a bit about yourselves and what you do within your respective organizations? Hi, my name is Elaine Young. I'm the Manager of Communications and Community Relations at BC Transplant, but I'm also the mother of a heart transplant recipient. So I kind of come from it professionally as well as personally. So you both have uh, wonderful opportunities to chat with people that are very much intertwined here. Um, So my name is Kate Chong. I'm the Director of Programs here at the BC and Yukon Branch for the Kidney Foundation. I've had the pleasure of working uh, with kidney patients, their care partners, healthcare professionals, and living donors. And we provide financial grants and reimbursements of living donor costs, peer engagement opportunities, and even accommodations for those here coming to Vancouver for a kidney transplant. Um, We also provide information information, manuals, and chat with patients or their families wherever they may be on their journey. And as a side note as well, I'd like to share that I'm also a kidney patient and very fortunate to have received a kidney from a living donor just over six years ago. Hey, you did such a great intro of the Kidney Foundation. I didn't say anything about BC Transplant. So (laughs) BC Transplant oversees all aspects of organ donation uh, in the province of British Columbia. So we manage the um, donor wait list We uh, also take care of our deceased donors, um, as well as provide care for patients post-transplant across the province. So uh, starting off with you, Elaine, as someone who works with BC Transplant, what advice or encouragement might you have for individuals who are considering registering as an organ donor? You know, great question. And it's one of those questions where, as a communications person, we, we ourselves have a lot of questions because we do know that the vast majority of the public supports organ donation. If you ask them, do you believe in organ donation? Do you think this is a good thing? The vast majority of people say yes. However, when it comes to registration, it's a much smaller percentage of people actually go to register as organ donors. And I think, you know, we want to remind people that it's so important that your family knows your decision, that your loved one knows your decision. You know, if something were to happen to you that would put you in a position to potentially be an organ donor at the end of life, it makes the process so much easier for your family if they know what your wishes are. So really, you know, we think of it as a, a as a choice that people can make to fulfill the wishes that they would like at the end of their life. And registering is a really important way of doing it, but also informing your family. What is it that you would like? And I think, you know, the question to ask yourself is, okay, do you believe in organ donation? Do you think this is something that you would want for yourself? Then if it is, make sure you talk about it or register so that your decision is known. You know, I understand that a lot of people, they don't want to talk about impending death or the possibility that this could happen because, you know, there's sort of that feeling like, oh, it's not going to happen. Like, I'm fine for now. I can just put it off. But but the reality is, you know, I hate to be the one to tell you all this, but we're all going to die at some point. 
Yes. You know, like that's just the reality for everybody. And so it's really just thinking about how do you want your end of life to look? And, you know, it's not the most pleasant thought, but it's better to have an idea of what you want and share that with people or register so that it can happen the way that you want it to happen. Yeah, definitely. I think if my death could help someone else, I would I'd be 100% into it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's a tough topic, but definitely. It is, yeah. Special. Thing I hope you two are registered. Yeah, <laughs> I think I'm going to. <laughs> it's put it on your driver's license. So it's actually it's not on your driver's license anymore. So oh, that I... yes, we have a lot of myths and and um sort of, you know, conceptions about organ donation and the process even of just registering that a lot of people don't understand and the driver's license system was in place you know maybe two decades ago but we now actually have an online organ donor registry that's connected to your health care card oh, so yeah you can go to the website take two minutes.ca and you register online and then it's sort of like in your health care record permanently at that point you could change it if you want to oh. but that's the way to officially be registered in British Columbia Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because I'm, well, I actually, I'm from Alberta, so I was a little, yeah, it's on my driver's license, but it's different interprovincially, which is why. It is, it is. Talk to Mm. you guys, you guys have the specific information for that. (laughs) In your experience, what are some common misconceptions or concerns that people have about organ donation, and how can we address them going forward? Well, actually, we just did some public opinion research polling, which is very interesting, And, and one of the big misconceptions that people have is that they won't actually be dead. They're concerned that if they're in a position where organ donation is a consideration, are they really going to do everything to save my life? That they sort of tied into the, am I actually going to be dead when my organs are recovered? So, you know, to sort of answer both questions at the same time, the organ donation process is actually quite separate from the care that you receive in the hospital. So the care that you receive in the hospital continues on and with no, there's no discussion of organ donation. No one, no one has access to your information, even about whether you're registered at the hospital level. So it's only at the point where the physician who is caring for you decides that there is nothing further that they can do that the conversation may turn to organ donation. But at that point, it becomes a referral to BC transplant. And only then would BC transplant personnel actually look up to see if you're registered. So it's completely separate. And none of that happens until in the hospital, like any patient, you know, it's 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 a discussion is had with the family. There's nothing further we can do. You know, that's where sort of the end of the medical support happens. And then if possible, that's when the conversation about transplant starts. So they're never mixed together. It has to be two physicians who make that decision that, you know, this is the end of treatment. And only after that, does it move on to the next phase? So I'd say that's one of the really big misconceptions that we've heard. The other one is the driver's license that people feel like the registration is tied to the driver's license. People feel like they're too old. They're, they're too sick to be considered as organ donors. And we like to say that the oldest organ donor in Canada, I think was in the nineties. So don't, don't rule yourself out is what we say to people, whether or not they've had various illnesses or, or health conditions or age. Do not rule yourself out. Fill out the form if that's important to you. And then at the end of your life, if you're in a position to be an organ donor, medical professionals will decide. So there's really no harm to signing up and then. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. OK, so, Elaine, in, in your view, What are the most important steps individuals and communities can take to support organ donation efforts and save lives in Canada? Well, that's a really great question. And I think the number one thing is to talk about it. Talk about it with your friends. Talk about it with your family. Just think about what it is that you want and make sure you share that. And, you know, by sharing your wishes, I think that starts the conversation going. I think, you know, awareness of organ donation and registering as an organ donor it really is just it's having conversations with people is honestly the number one thing because you know as you explain Alberta has a slightly different system of registering so it, it can get confusing if you know you're moving back and forth across the country but at the end of the day if you told your family what you wanted they would be the ones to make the ultimate decision so I think the more we can talk about it the more we can normalize um, organ donation And actually, if we can normalize all conversations around end of life, whether or not they involve organ donation, I think that that's what where we need to move to as a society, because we need to make this just the same that we celebrate birth and talk about birth. 
we also need to celebrate and talk about death and, and all the parts that encompass, you know, a good death. Mm, I agree. It's always good to have a plan. It's a lot more comfortable that way. Exactly. Exactly. Everybody. It's funny. I actually had this conversation with my dad <laughs> this oh. morning. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> you knew you were coming into this, uh, you know, this interview. So it's it's good to have, it's good that you had that conversation. <laughs> and what resources would you recommend for individuals interested in learning more about the process of organ donation in BC? Well, we can certainly visit our website, transplant.bc.ca. We do have a lot of information on there. I think there's also, you just in general, you know, their media stories. And obviously, not all media is accurate, but, you know, you can really find a lot of great examples of what organ donation can do just in popular media. If you think of some of the high profile celebrities, uh, Selena Gomez, she received a kidney transplant from uh, a friend. And I think it's everywhere. You just don't know who might need an organ one day. It could be you. It could be your loved one. You're actually much more likely to require an organ transplant than you will actually ever be able to be an organ donor. It's actually really hard to be an organ donor. So your chances of actually needing an organ one day are are way higher. And so I think we just need to really look at it. If you see a story that resonates with you, you know, like read more about it, look it up, like find out, ask people in your, in your circle of colleagues and and friends and and you know family do you know anyone who's been impacted by organ donation i bet you would find that you know someone who has either had a situation where their loved one was an organ donor or they had someone in their family who required an organ transplant and you know just start asking questions i think curiosity goes a long way to getting us answers to a lot of these things that's when I found, uh, I know for, for my, my sake sort of thing, as soon as you get diagnosed with something like in my case, kidney disease, you know, it very quickly becomes all of a sudden everywhere in your life, there's something related to kidney in there. And you're just like, oh, this was all here. It just wasn't, it didn't resonate with me at that moment. And now it's everywhere. Right. And so the connection, if the degree of, <laughs> of connection is, is not very far, usually when it comes to that, it's just, yeah, to the general public that may not be talking about this every day. It doesn't maybe resonate, but you know, it's a very, very much needed thing within our communities to be aware of and, and to know about for sure. Yeah, for sure. Starting those conversations and getting the ball rolling. And it's so common. I mean, I even I know someone who's had a kidney transplant. Yeah, well, yeah, my mom had a kidney transplant from her sister. Yeah. And you realize kind of it comes up in the conversation and there's always a little connection somewhere here or there. So. Mm -hmm. So can you share your perspective on the future of organ donation and transplants in Canada, including any potential innovations or advancements on the horizon? Wow, that's like, there's so much there when I saw that question. <laughs> um, you know, the really exciting thing is, um, obviously, while patients are getting transplants, while donors are, are um, being cared for and donating organs, whether living or deceased, you know, there there's so much research that's happening behind the scenes. And a lot of our clinicians are actively involved in research and really, you know, trying to make transplant better. So you may not know this, but transplants are not a cure. So it does usually, not always, like in the case of cystic fibrosis, you actually still have cystic fibrosis, even if you get transplanted lungs. So it changes your medical condition, but you still have a medical condition. So when you get the transplant, you actually have the disease of transplant, you know, because it's not a cure. You have to take a lot of medication to manage your transplant and you have a lifetime of medical appointments to manage your transplant. So it's not like you broke your arm, you get a cast, it comes off and like your arm is as is, is good as new, sometimes better. That's not the way transplant works. So, so much of the research is focused on how do we make transplant a cure? What can we do to change the body's immune system? What can we do to make a better match so that people don't go into rejection? How can we um, have them take fewer drugs to manage their organ and to reduce rejection? So there's so many, there's so many incredible people doing incredible things. I mean, I think in the future, you know, things like better matching for organs would go a long way to improve the uh, lifespan of, of transplanted organs. Things like looking at how the immune system works. Can, is there some way we can tweak the immune system so that it better accepts the organ without the drugs? Things even like research, we, there has been a ton of research about the COVID vaccine. Does it work for transplant recipients? A lot of research about mental health. A lot of research to help make the donation process better 
How can we utilize more of the organs from donors? You know, there are a certain number of organs that obviously can't be used because there may be something like they're not optimal organs. So we don't want to transplant them. But can we fix those organs? to make them more optimal so that we can have more organs available for transplant. So, I mean, that's just like a tiny little sliver of some of the work that's ongoing. So I think there's a lot happening. I don't know if I can name one specific thing that will will be coming in the immediate future, but there's a lot of uh, excitement in all those areas. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's good. Sorry, that was a bit of a big question. It was a question. <laughs> yeah, big one. So what does getting a kidney transplant look like for Canadians in terms of waitlist times and success rates? So I think the good news is overall, the success rates of transplants in general, kidneys and other organs has actually improved a lot over the years. So I think, you know, a lot of the management of a patient post-transplant has really done a lot. I think in terms of wait times, you know, it's very dependent on a particular person's situation, but generally speaking, and it's different depending on whether you're getting a living donation or a deceased donation. So with living donation, there's definitely more of a move to try and get people transplanted before they even go on dialysis. There are better outcomes with living donation versus deceased donation. And if you can avoid that dialysis period, then the patients go into it much healthier and stronger, recovery is better, all those things. But in terms of deceased donation, you know, it, the, the weight kind of starts based upon your time um, that you go on dialysis. So there's a very complicated allocation algorithm, but the things they look at are obviously match. You know, if you're technically next on the list, but you're not actually a match for the kidney that is available, then obviously you wouldn't get that transplant. It would go to the next person who's sort of a match. So it's wait times on dialysis, as well as like blood type, tissue typing, the size, because it also needs to be a size match. So there are many, many, many different factors that go into play when it comes to to matching an organ to the right recipient. And, you know, there actually is a lot of research happening in that area. So we could see some changes coming to that as well. But generally speaking, you know, it can be anywhere from, you know, approximately right now, our median wait times are about 34 months from dialysis start to transplant. But again, you know, that's it's not to say that like if Kate was on the wait list right now, that it would be like about 34 months. It's honestly, this is median. So it's a huge variety. How sick are you? Like how, how urgently would you need a kidney? And I think also too, like blood types, it makes a difference. So certain blood types are harder to match. And so it's just like when we hear about blood donation, you know, they need specific kinds of blood for specific um, recipients. It's the same thing with kidney. So depending on your blood type, it can also take longer. There's um, priority given to pediatric patients, for example. We also are part of the highly sensitized patient uh, national wait list. So if you are someone who is really hard to match, you get placed on this list and you would get national priority if an organ comes up that is a match to you. So this is, it's a very complicated sort of system to try and get the right organ to the right recipient. Yeah, there's a lot to it. Yeah, lots of factors that Mm -hmm. play a part. Mm -hmm. For sure. And Elaine, I know you have a meeting, so we don't want to keep you past uh, your time limit. I do, I do. But if you have any follow-up questions, you know, I'm happy to send you any information or um, send you any links or anything. So let me know if there's anything else that comes up during your discussion with Kate that that you need some more details on. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thanks for your interest. Yeah, we we love talking about organ donation because that's the only way we're gonna we're gonna make a difference. So thank you. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to a Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. That was an interview with Elaine Yong, the manager of communications and community relations for BC Transplant. We'll now be continuing the conversation with Kate Chong, the director of programs and services for the Kidney Foundation of Canada, BC and Yukon Branch. So Kate, can you tell us a bit about the Kidney Foundation of Canada and your work with the organization? Absolutely. So for almost 60 years, uh, the Kidney Foundation has had the vision to help have a positive impact on millions of Canadians who are living or at risk of kidney disease. And we do this through multiple different ways, including our programs and services, research opportunities, and of course, awareness campaigns. Um, Within the foundation, I am the director of programs for the BC and Yukon branch. um, And I have the wonderful pleasure of working with kidney patients, their care partners, health 
healthcare professionals and uh, even living donors. And that could be through uh, providing financial grants, reimbursement to our living donors for travel costs, peer engagement opportunities, and even accommodations for those coming to Vancouver for a kidney transplant. We also have lots of information and manuals and just chat with patients and their families wherever they might be on their journey. And as a side point, I always like to share that I'm also a kidney patient myself and very fortunate to have received a kidney from a living donor just over six years ago. That's a special uh, thing to receive. Yes, my wonderful husband was my donor. And uh, now we have two beautiful young children. Um, Because of that wonderful gift, we were able to do and have our family, which is awesome. What are the odds that you guys were a match? (laughs) <laughs> we get asked, asked a lot, actually. Uh, we were just, uh, actually, we celebrated our first year wedding anniversary two weeks after our surgery. So people joke, well, did you know his blood type before you oh. got married? <laughs> and I said, well, yes, I did know his blood type type and I knew it was compatible, but there's a quite an extensive process to deem what is actually compatible. But you would be amazed actually through my work and the amount of couples that end up being a match with each other. I get to see great uh, matches that happen and yeah, let it be, you know, a husband, wife or brother, sister or parent to child. It's amazing the matches that can happen and uh, it happens more often than you think. So so incredible. Ooh, such a special gift you can give. Yeah. And, yeah. Right? Who knew? (laughs) So kidneys are one of the few organs that can be donated by living donors. What would you say to someone who is just learning about kidney disease and considering becoming a donor? Yeah, absolutely. Isn't it amazing and fortunate that most people are born with two kidneys and you can very much live a healthy life with just one. So living kidney donation um, is definitely the best outcome for those who are in need of it. So you might have a family or friend who might be in need, or if you can believe it, some people donate anonymously, which is a beautiful thing as well. And if, if there's interest to in finding out more, um, of course, our website, kidney.ca, has lots of information around kidney, kidney health, kidney disease, that aspect of things. But then around the living donation, uh, BC Transplant website, um, they have a whole area about if you're interested to be a living donor and can really kind of take you through the different steps around how to go about doing that. Um, and the local hospitals that do do the living donation kind of work up around that. And then, you know, one of the aspects, especially if you don't have a direct connection, sometimes it's kind of nice to chat with someone um, that's been through that process before. And here at the Kidney Foundation here in BC and Yukon, we have living donors that are actually trained to be able to chat with others that might be wanting to go through that process. So they can have kind of a real life, you know, chat with somebody to say, hey, how was your process of going through this? Tell me the good, the bad, the ugly, as I like to say, you know, always keeping in mind that everyone's journey is different both from the donor perspective and the recipient. So keeping that in mind, but it's a great resource and opportunity for those that might be interested in chatting a little bit more about it. That's great. Connecting people and Mm -hmm. good support system, it sounds like. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. It's a key piece, right? Definitely. Mm -hmm. So what does the process of becoming a kidney donor look like in British Columbia in terms of eligibility and testing? Yeah, so there are numerous steps involved to deem if if someone is an appropriate living kidney donor. Um, it really starts, and this is where the one website I just referenced to, uh, the BC Transplant website, really lays it out for you. But usually where it begins is you kind of do a medical and social history questionnaire. Kind of it, once you fill that out, if there's no concerns, then there's usually some blood tests that are arranged to check for compatibility. That's where you kind of get the bigger details of, okay, would this be a, a generally um, possible match directly. Once that's figured out, then there are several other tests um, to ensure that it's safe for you to no- donate. Of course, they would never want to move forward with a living donor if it wasn't safe for you now or in the future, depending on any risk factors you might have. Uh, again, if that kind of still looks great, then you usually get the pleasure to come down to the Vancouver area to one of the transplant hospitals and meet with the kidney transplant team. And usually that testing kind of takes over two days or kind of over the two day period to go through and meet a number of the different program areas. Uh, within kidney transplant. 
If deemed an appropriate donor, then of course, a surgery date would be booked. I know that me saying it is super quick um, for time of how that happens, but it can take time. And really the dedication and commitment of the potential donor to keep each of those steps moving forward. Um, the transplant hospitals will never push back to say, hey, where's this at? That sort of thing, because it is the donor's decision to move that process forward. I always like to put a little side note as well that if donors are coming down to um, Vancouver for let that be the assessment testing or their surgery stage through the Kidney Foundation and BC Transplant, we have the opportunity to reimburse for some of the travel costs. And that's called LODERP or the Living Organ Donor Expense Reimbursement Program. Hence why we needed to come up with an acronym for that one. And again, that helps with the reimbursement of costs for travel expenses. And that information you can find on our website at kidney.ca. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So can you provide some insight into the prevalence of kidney disease in Canada? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one in 10 Canadians are impacted by kidney disease in some way. So that's, you know, you get in a room with 50 people, there's at least five that in some aspect, and that could be a very minor impact to someone that's maybe in kidney failure or transplant. So there's a lot of Canadians that are dealing with this. The top two reasons people have kidney issues are quite often related to high blood pressure pressure or diabetes. And then there's also communities that are just at general higher risk of developing things like um, kidney disease, including Indigenous, Asian, South Asian, African, Caribbean, and Hispanic. So if you fall into those risk categories, it's always great to make sure you're staying in touch with your healthcare professionals. Let that be a GP, that sort of thing, to check on your kidney health on an ongoing basis, just because those risk factors do make you at a higher possibility to have some kidney issues along your life. Yeah, definitely. So how does the Kidney Foundation work with other organizations, healthcare providers, and government bodies to enhance organ donation and transplantation in the province? Absolutely. Well, we work very closely with numerous healthcare organizations. So here in BC specifically, like Elaine and I with BC Transplant, and BC Renal is another big organization here in BC that oversees kidney health and that sort of thing. But So we work very closely as uh, the Kidney Foundation with both of those groups on multiple different from, you know, awareness campaigns to, you know, we get together every six weeks just to chat about, okay, what's everybody doing? You know, what educational items can we get out to our kidney? community and making sure that we're not overlapping and that we're working together as, you know, a cohesive group across BC for kidney patients and their families. You know, developing relationships from the government side of things, Ministry of Health and highlighting of what's happening in the kidney community and what impacts the patients are experiencing here in BC. So kind of trying to be that other voice or just, you know, knowing or what we're hearing out in our community and letting those that be to know where, where maybe some of the support needs to go as well. So we play multiple different roles when we're a kidney foundation, but the biggest thing is, of course, educating and, uh, you know, supporting our kidney patients across BC, um, let it be from just being diagnosed all the way through to post-transplant as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of collaboration. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's come a long way, I will say, over the last number of years too, right? You know, it's easy for each group to kind of do their own thing. But when you come together as a team, it, you know, it, it's more powerful and, and you see better impact. And it goes to the end user, which is the kidney patients and their family is that, you know, there's better benefit in that sense of working together. Definitely. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are you able to speak a bit about the kidney pair donation program and what it means for kidney donation in Canada? Absolutely. So it just provides another option for those living with kidney disease. And let's say they had someone step forward, but they weren't a compatible match to them directly, which, you know, being through the process myself, it can be a devastating news to find out that, and sometimes you don't even know who's being worked up. That's part of it, right? But, you know, if you don't have someone's like, oh, I really want to donate, but I can't match you. The kidney paired exchange is an awesome opportunity to have another chance to get a kidney in a different way. So let's say someone isn't a match to you directly, but they there's a big database across Canada that has people that are needing and or wanting to provide kidney donation and they can make a match, hopefully. Sometimes it's a direct match. So let's say the recipient and the donor match perfectly with a different recipient and donation and they make those interchanges. Or sometimes it can be a large chain. And this can be across Canada. So it's not just here in B 
BC, this database is all across Canada. So this is where anonymous donors come into play usually because they don't have a direct connection to any one person. And so they can help these chains kind of come to a full circle and allow that opportunity. So it provides that additional chance that um, a donor can move forward and maybe donate to someone else. But in turn, their person that they know will receive a kidney as well. So even if your contact isn't a direct match, then there's still a chance that you might be able to work that out. Absolutely. Yeah. So given your experience with the Kidney Foundation, what do you see as the most pressing issue or areas in need of improvement within the organ donation and transplantation system in BC? Yeah, that's, you know, it's a big overarching question for sure. Um, But, you know, continuing to help patients no matter where they are in their journey. We, you know, we do see a number of very low income patients, kidney patients through our programs and services that we have through the foundation. And one thing that um, to zoom in on a little bit, something specific here, sometimes people as they are working out for transplant hit certain barriers. There's certain things that recipients need to kind of mark and check off to go to transplant. And one of those pieces is dental. And as we can all appreciate dental is not cheap. So uh, recipients need to make sure that their dental health is at its best sort of thing. There's no infections and that they would not be going in a vulnerable place to transplant. For those that are low income, this is a really big struggle because they might need thousands of dollars of work on their teeth and they don't have the financial means to do that. So a number of years ago, um, us here at the Kidney Foundation BC Newcom branch, we highlighted that as a barrier and um, created some funding to be able to put towards that. So we've been able to do that for the last, gosh, it's probably been at least three years now where we can have kind of a thousand to two thousand dollars that can, if they meet our financial criteria, we can uh, put towards some of their dental work to hopefully help them get that checked off on their list toward transplantation. That is so amazing that you guys can contribute to that to help people. Yeah, it's, you know, it it was one of those things, my predecessor, she, you know, it's clearly something that we kept seeing coming in within our general short-term financial grant program that we have, but that's a very limited fund that we can do on a yearly basis for those that meet our criteria. And, you know, she highlighted that dental is a big piece. And so that's where this initiative came to. So, you know, there's always work for improvement on these type of things. And, you know, we continue to look at what other gaps and, and barriers there are for recipients that are going through this process to help hopefully close that and get more people transplanted. That's awesome. Um, So what can individuals and communities do to get involved with the Kidney Foundation of Canada and support kidney health and organ donation? Absolutely. So our volunteers are everything to us. And we love when people like to get involved. We know that could be as much as a community walk. We have our kidney walks every year so people can get involved from their community roots um, aspect um, to even becoming a peer mentor. Let's say you are living with kidney disease um, and or a living donor and, you know, you've had some experience in, in your journey and you want to help others that are going through that. We have our peer engagement program for people to chat over the phone or we're starting virtual groups things that people can engage. There's so many different aspects and, um, you know, we love to share stories of our patients so people know that they're not alone in in this journey. So if people want to connect and see what's going on in our world with the Kidney Foundation, you can check out kidney.ca or we have an awesome new platform called kidneywellnesshub.ca, which is an amazing resource for kidney patients no matter where they are in their journey. So we always love to get more people in, in our community. That's great. Yeah. So um, is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners? Yeah, you know, between Elaine and I, you know, we provide a, a few different perspectives when it comes to uh, kidney health, kidney organ and, uh, organ donation and transplant. You know, definitely educate yourself, communicate with your family around your choice from deceased donation to if you know someone going through the process, you know, if you have questions, we at the Kidney Foundation are happy to chat with people uh, no matter where they're going in their journey. As we know, it can be uh, a pretty overwhelming thing when first diagnosed or, you know, those transitions and from you know, going to dialysis or transplant, those are big pieces in people's lives. And we want to make sure that they know that uh, they have, you know, an organization to support them behind them or and try to answer questions as best as possible. And there's a really great community out there for organ donation in general, but also kidney patients. And um, there's lots of great resources online as well to help people as they maneuver these, uh, their journey. Yeah. Definitely. Well, you guys are definitely making a huge difference. I can tell. Well, I'm very passionate, as you can appreciate, um, being a recipient uh, myself, as well as, you know, just working with those um, within the kidney world. You know, it 
there's there's so many wonderful people and and you know there's really hard days for individuals and uh, and then there's really great days as well so it's just amazing to be able to provide some some help out there in the world um, in some capacity and we look forward to continuing to help kidney patients across BC so thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be part of our interview today it was great talking with you and provided some great information. Thank you for you guys for sharing this wonderful message um, around organ donation. And uh, hopefully people have learned um, some interesting facts or information that they didn't know before listening. If you've just joined us, you're listening to A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. That was an interview with Elaine Yong, the Manager of Communications and Community Relations for BC Transplant, and Kate Chong, the Director of Programs and Services for the Kidney Foundation of Canada, BC and Yukon Branch. Those of you who are in the nursing program tuning in, our ASC group is going to be doing presentations on resiliency and coping. This presentation will be aimed towards first, second, and third years, providing you all with tips and tricks to get through the tough workload of the nursing program. We look forward to seeing you in class. And now we're just gonna take a quick break for a quiz. So, do you know what the most common blood type in Canada is? You got it, it's O positive. 39% of Canadians share this blood type. O positive red blood cells can be used to treat any patient with a positive RH blood type, which makes a measurable difference in emergency situations. Not only O positive blood makes a difference though. O negative red blood cells are compatible with all other blood types. This means that in critical emergencies, when there is no time to confirm a patient's blood type, O negative blood can make a life-saving difference. Our next guest is Patricia Wilms. Patricia works as a community development manager with Canadian Blood Services and will be answering some questions about blood, plasma, and stem cell donation in BC. Well, thank you, Patricia, for being on our show today. Can you tell our listeners a bit about yourself and your role within Canadian Blood Services? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me, Cassidy. I'm, I'm really tickled to participate in this. So my name is Patricia Wilms. I am a community development manager with Canadian Blood Services, and I live in Victoria and work out of our uh, Victoria office. Now, if your listeners are wondering what does a community development manager do, I'm responsible for for all of our communities across the island that host um, mobile blood donation events. So my work involves obviously booking those venues, but also working with the numerous partners we have in the communities to help fill the seats for those and promoting the events as well, of course. So diverse role you have? It is. No two days are alike, which is which makes it really interesting. And honestly, all of us are really passionate about this work that we get to do every day, work that makes a difference. As our CEO always reminds us, what we do matters. Yeah, exactly. And kind of leading into that. Um Could you explain the importance of blood donation and its impact on the Canadian healthcare system? Absolutely. I would say, and I think all of my colleagues would agree, blood donation is very important. Blood is a critical part of everyday medical care, including for major surgeries, medical procedures, cancer treatments, and managing a lot of diseases and disorders as well. And as you and many people would know, there is no substitute for blood. And what might you say to someone who's considering donating blood? For example, a first-time donor who's interested but hasn't taken action yet. Well, I would say that, honestly, the greatest human connection happens when you give part of yourself to make life better for others. And I think blood donation, plasma donation, joining a stem cell registry is all part of that. As a lot of people and Canadian patients know only too well, life can change in seconds. And you or someone you love could need blood urgently. Yeah, you never know uh, when you might need it or when someone you know might need it. It's a good point. Exactly. Yeah. And I would say, you know, chat with people who have donated before. And we have great resources online on our website as well. And know that your donation does make a difference to a Canadian patient and their family. So on that note, what does the blood donation process look like in British Columbia? Well, in its simplest form, I would say it's sort of four components. It includes getting registered, being screened, 
doing your actual donation and then some post donation care. So when actually donating blood, the standard donation is about 488 mils, something like close to that, slightly less than half a liter or about two cups. And just so everyone knows, that represents a pretty small portion of the blood in a person's body because the average adult has about five liters. The other thing I would let people know is that the entire process takes around an hour. We like to have you in and out sooner than that, but we sort of say an hour from start to finish, which is from registration till we're feeding you juice and cookies and chips after. Nice, you get juice and some snacks. Exactly. We have some good ones, they say. (laughs) (laughs) And what is the eligibility criteria for donating blood in BC? So it it is the same throughout the country. Um, Canadian Blood Services operates in all the provinces except Quebec, so it's the same across. So generally speaking, you have to be 17 years or older. In general, good health. You want to be feeling well the day you donate uh, and able to perform your normal activities. You will be asked a variety of questions. We call it our health assessment questionnaire. So your final eligibility is determined in a screening booth with one of our staff members. Okay. And so how can potential donors determine if they're eligible to donate? So we have some really great tools. We have a basic eligibility quiz on our website and on the app. We also on our website, if you go to blood.ca, there's a page called the ABCs of eligibility. And that's all for for donating blood, plasma, platelets, that sort of thing. And kind of by alphabet, you would be able to look up T for travel or M for medication or something like that. I would, I would say a couple of other things. If our website and the quiz doesn't give you the answer whether you're eligible or not, people can give a call to our toll-free number and ask to speak to a healthcare professional like one of our nurses, and they can go through the finer details of eligibility. So just for the sake of your listeners, that toll-free number is, some of you may have seen it, it's one triple eight to donate and so that's one eight 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 two three six six two eight three. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we'll include that in our show notes after, so oh, listeners that's great, can Christy. go back and link it. So, what happens to your blood after the donation process? Mm, that's a great question. All components are stored at the appropriate temperature and in the appropriate conditions to optimize their quality and shelf life. And basically, I can also say that if the testing for transmissible diseases is is found to be negative, the components then become available for distribution. So I would say to your listeners, the blood that you give will be used within days to help someone give someone life or improve their health. And how often can you donate blood? This is an easy one. (laughs) Men can donate every 56 days and women can donate every 84 days. So men every two months and women every three months. So once you've booked your appointment, how can you prepare for your blood donation appointment and what should you bring with you? Also very good because you do want to prepare your body so that this is a positive and easy experience for you. So you will hear us talking about hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. So really important to make sure that you drink lots of water starting even the day before and certainly the day of. I would say make sure you eat a healthy meal with some protein in it before you're going to donate, ideally two to three hours before. Get a good night's sleep. Make sure you're feeling well that day. If you're not, then I would reschedule your appointment. The other thing uh, I would also say is if you can have a salty snack and a good half liter of water just right before you donate. The other thing you definitely want to bring is some um, ID as well, Uh, some government issued ID. If someone has donated already, they will have a Canadian Blood Services donor card, either a physical one or the digital one on the app. Either are good. And for our listeners who are new to the process, what is plasma donation? Mm-hmm. That's great because so many people think of us as 
as our name would indicate, is all about blood, but we're about so much more than that. So I'm, I'm glad you've asked the question. So plasma is the rich, protein-rich liquid in blood that helps other blood components circulate throughout the body. Some donated plasma is transfused directly into patients, but most of it is actually made into life-saving medications like immunoglobulins. And those medications are used to treat people with autoimmune diseases, immunodeficiency, neurological disorders, and a whole bunch of other medical conditions. And for a lot of these people, they have no other treatment option other than these plasma products. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So um, so is the eligibility criteria for donating plasma different to that of donating blood? I would say that the process and, and everything is largely the same as for blood donation. Again, it's going to include registration and screening, um, donation, post-donation care. Some of the screening process might be slightly different. I would say the experience will be very familiar to anyone who's donated blood. And I would say the best thing is to check blood.ca for their eligibility criteria for donating plasma. Yeah, we'll provide that link in our show notes after as well. Excellent. So uh, how often can you donate plasma? Mm -hmm. Good question. You can give plasma more frequently than whole blood, as often actually as once a week. And the reason for that is the red blood cells are returned to the donor's body and only plasma is taken. Oh, wow. So a little more often. I actually didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. On a different note, uh, could you talk a bit about the stem cell donation process? Sure. This another really uh, component of, of our business and our work for uh, Canadian patients. One of the big things we do is we get people to join the stem cell registry. And we are then part of a worldwide registry who can so it can help people all across the world. I would say there, there are over 80 diseases or disorders that can be treated with a stem cell transplant. And that includes things like leukemia, lymphoma, other blood cancers. And basically, the stem cell transplant re replaces the patient's unhealthy stem cells with that of a matching donor's healthy stem cells. And I would also let your listeners know that there are three sources of blood stem cells, which is a little bit about what you're asking, and they are to be used for patient transplants. It could be from, from the bone marrow from the peripheral blood or the circulating blood, or also from umbilical cord blood. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So to join the register, we uh, were looking for 17 to 35 year olds from a diverse range of ethnic and racial backgrounds. And what you do is you, you, in your registration process, you do some cheek swabs. So it's super simple. You register, you do your cheek swabs, mail your kid away, and then you're on the registry waiting for a, to be contacted by us in case you're a match for a patient. People can register online. They can go to blood.ca to have a kit mailed to their home. Perfect. And then you just do the swab yourself and send it you off? And yes, you do. It's pretty easy? It is. So how can people sign up to donate blood plasma or stem cells? Super easy. I would say th three ways, unless you're close to a donor center, of course, you can go right down. But I would say visit blood.ca, go to our website. You could use or download the Give Blood app or call our toll-free number. You'll be able to find and book uh, appointments at a donor center where, where you are. And are there way other ways individuals can get involved with Canadian blood services outside of blood and plasma donation, for example, through volunteering, fundraising, or promoting awareness? I love that you asked this question because it's important. So many people want to help, but they may find they're not eligible. And that can be really disappointing. And so it's good to know that there are other ways to help. And there are plenty other ways you can help Canada's lifeline. So as you mentioned, they can volunteer their time. You could be an in-clinic or an in-community volunteer with us. You could make a one-time or recurring financial donation, raising funds in support of, of our operation. Financial contributions support our national recruitment efforts that need a boost in times of great need. And, and we can also invest in new innovative technologies, conduct research um, that will hopefully change tomorrow for the better. I would also say really important if someone's not eligible to donate, 
They can encourage their friends, family, colleagues to donate or team members, that sort of thing. I would say that kind of advocacy is also really, really important. Even following and tagging us on social media plays a role and helps out. So there are all, all sorts of ways to help. Getting people talking in the community and getting the word out there. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. you know what's interesting? There was an IPSA survey that was done recently. And 87% of people who were surveyed said they recognized that the need for blood was constant. But 50% of them said they hadn't donated because they were waiting to be asked. So because you've posed that question to me, are there other ways? I would say to your listeners, to your uh, fellow nursing students and, and the VIU campus, ask people. If you can't donate, ask others to donate on your behalf. Yeah, no, it's a great, uh, great way to get the movement going and get people to take action in the community. Mm -hmm. So I think that concludes all of our questions. Um, is there anything mm -hmm. else you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I, I guess in summary, I would say that everything we do to help patients in Canada depends on our donors. Donors are the vital links in Canada's lifeline, who, and they are the ones who improve the lives of patients every day. Literally, they help us to fulfill our vision, which is to help every patient, to match every need, to serve every Canadian. So, and, and I would say to your listeners, Patients are waiting for life-saving donations, and every donation you make has a ripple effect that goes on to have a lasting impact in the lives of those strangers and their families. Yeah, and it's, well, it's such a special thing you can do and just take an hour out of your day to donate exactly. blood and help another person out there. Exactly. Yeah, well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. You are, you're so welcome. I was pleased to chat with you. Thank you for taking the time and, and helping promote the cause through, through what you're doing, Cassidy. No, it's an important thing to get people talking about, and I hope uh, some listeners will sign up to donate. Sounds great. Look forward to seeing them at our donation centers. For those of you who are just joining us, you're listening to A Sound Constitution, and that was an interview with Patricia Wilms, a Community Development Manager with Canadian Blood Services. Now over to Ashley for a quick segment on stem cells and stem cell donation. Thanks, Cassidy. I'd like to share that all of the following information is provided from the Canadian Blood Services. So what is stem cell donation? Stem cells are immature cells that can develop into the cells present in your bloodstream. They come from bone marrow, circulating blood, or umbilical cord blood. When a patient needs stem cells, it means their bone marrow has failed due to an illness. Blood stem cells can treat over 80 diseases and disorders, including blood cancers, aplastic anemia, and inherited immune and metabolic disorders. You may be wondering, what does the process look like to donate stem cells? The first step is to see if you are eligible to donate. So if you are between the ages of 17 and 35, in good general health, free of any infectious diseases or health issues, then you are eligible to donate. Then you can go ahead and register with the Canadian Blood Services, and they will send you a swab kit with instructions to be sent back to them for genetic testing. Then they will keep in touch with you when there is a match and your donation is needed. This could take months or even up to years. A match is found according to DNA markers called human leukocyte antigens that are found on the surface of white blood cells and are inherited from our parents. HLA is somewhat similar to blood types, but much more diverse. The most likely match is your sibling. So now the time has come. You received a call from the Canadian Blood Services, and they said they have found a match in need of your stem cells. What happens now? Now it's time to retrieve the stem cells. There are three ways to do this. Through the bone marrow, through peripheral blood, or through umbilical cord blood. The most common way to collect is through the peripheral bloodstream. A procedure called apheresis is implemented, where the blood is removed from you and goes through a machine that separates the stem cells, and then the remaining components are returned to the donor. This process takes about four to six hours. There are minimal risks with this procedure, but some side effects include muscle pain, headaches, and flu-like symptoms prior to donation. Another collection method is through the bone marrow. This is a surgical procedure under general anesthetic where a hollow needle is inserted into the back of the pelvic bone and the stem cells are removed from the liquid marrow. Side effects of this procedure include soreness, bruising, and fatigue. 
collection from the umbilical cord is done after the safe delivery of a baby and can be discussed with your physician prior to giving birth. Now your stem cells have been collected and they will be delivered to the recipient to help save their life. Stem cell donation is completely free and can truly change someone's life. For more information and to join the stem cell registry, visit the Canadian Blood Services website or call 1-888-236-6283. Another great resource for information is the World Marrow Donor Association. Visit their website for more information. And remember, you could be a hero to a patient in need. All right, ASC community, I have a little quiz for you. What percentage of Canadians say they have received or know someone who has received blood products? Is it A, 32%, B, 52%, C, 12%, D, 36%? You have five seconds to answer the question. And it's B, 52%. According to Statistics Canada, 52% of Canadians have reported they have or know someone who has received blood. Being over half the Canadian population, there is a constant need for blood donations. Here's a little fun fact. With half of Canadians needing blood or know someone who has needed blood, did you know that only 4% of Canadians donate their blood? With such a low percentage of blood donors, here are some upcoming blood donation events here in Nanaimo. First location is the Bebin Park Social Center, the address being 2300 Bowen Road. The dates for blood donations are November 7th, 8th, and 10th. The next location is the Bowen Park Auditorium, address being 500 Bowen Road. Dates for blood donations are November 25th and December 23rd. The final location within Nanaimo is the Vancouver Island Conference Center, located 101 Gordon Street, and the date for blood donations will be January 20th in 2024. I hope to see you there. Now, back to you, Cassidy. Concluding this episode, I would like to give a huge thank you to Kate Chong, Elaine Young, and Patricia Wilms for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be a part of our episode. All show notes for today's episode can be found on our social media pages, as well as information regarding future episodes. We'd like to give a huge thank you to our listeners for tuning in to today's episode on organ donation and blood donation. This has been A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM, and we hope to catch you next week for another episode.